this week on Healthy Living, we shed a light on restrictive growth or dwarfism. An advocacy group in Johannesburg fights for the rights of little people. And South African professor Salim Abdul Karim shares some insights on the country's COVID-19 outbreak. Plus, when will countries reach herd immunity for COVID-19? These stories and more in this edition of Healthy Living. Hello, I'm Lina Khmudu. Thank you for joining us on Healthy Living. Dwarfism or restricted growth is a medical or genetic condition that causes people to be shorter than normal. There are more than a hundred conditions that cause dwarfism, with achondroplasia the most common form of dwarfism. The National Organization for Red Disorders say about 80% of patients have achondroplasia due to a genetic mutation. The other 20% of cases are inherited from a parent. Among other things, people with achondroplasia can develop hydrocephalus, a buildup of fluid around the brain, and repeated ear infections, which can cause hearing loss. People with dwarfism grow no higher than 4 feet 10 inches. From navigating shopping centers to government offices, South Africa's little people say public spaces aren't designed to be accessible for them. One advocacy group in Johannesburg is calling for better support to help people live independently. For VOA, Lisa Givetash has this report. Different, abnormal, and very small. Those are just some of the words Olivia Radebe says have been used to describe her in her recently published memoir. The 27-year-old writer says her late grandmother encouraged her to persevere with her studies and with living independently, and she has but Radebe says she still faces practical challenges navigating life in Johannesburg. You cannot uh, ask help and not pay someone, you know, because I'm not on a permanent job. And also the money that I get from the government is not enough to, st to sustain me to that certain level where I can afford to pay everyone and anyone. Like, it's a bit of a challenge. So in other words, I have to beg someone to help me. There are hundreds of conditions that cause restricted growth, achondroplasia being the most common, a genetic condition that results in short arms and legs. Radebe was never diagnosed as a child. Now, she says it would be too costly to go to a private specialist to find out. Radebe says she sometimes wonders what her underlying health issue is. So if I was diagnosed earlier, maybe I would have known or, or, that, um, okay, fine, in 10 years' time I should expect this, I should live like this, there are certain things that I need to, to avoid in order for me to have a long life. Specialized care isn't evenly available across the country. Parents have to look to big cities like Cape Town and Johannesburg to find the best resources for their children who show signs of restricted growth. So a parent will go and uh, take the child, but the, the nurses, the doctors are not aware of the condition that the child has. Raising awareness about people with dwarfism is one of the main reasons why Piet Nell established the nonprofit Short Statured Persons South Africa. That we can share ideas and come together and also that the public can know what we are about. The 57-year-old says he struggled with accessibility and discrimination throughout his life. Nell says the organization gives people like him more power to advocate for themselves and their unique needs. That's why they say nothing about us without us. You can't talk for us, we must talk for ourselves. Like I say, we must stand together and fight for our rights. And the country, he says, is starting to listen. Nell's group met with South Africa's social development minister to discuss their health and reproductive needs that go unaddressed. He hopes it will be the first step toward bringing more support within their reach. Dr. Edward Kija is a pediatric neurologist in Tanzania. He tells us more about dwarfism. Dwarfism, or it's also been referred to as short stature, uh, it's a condition which affects individuals um, which makes them abnormally short. There are many causes. The first one is the genetics, where we talk about conditions which affect a single gene, which can lead into an individual becoming uh, abnormally short 
or disease condition which affects the whole chromosome, which may also lead to individuals becoming abnormally short. The second uh, category which are endocrine disorders, which affect production of hormones. The third category is um, individuals who uh, have got some nutritional deficiencies. And the fourth category is uh, environmental factors. And the prognosis will really depend on what is the underlying cause of short stature for that particular individual. So there are other conditions that lead, uh, that cause short stature, which are also associated with other comorbid conditions. And these vary from cardiac conditions. There are certain individuals, for example, who have got short stature because of genetic condition like Turner syndrome. They may also have other cardiac and vascular conditions which might impair their quality of life. They may also have other conditions which may also affect their lung function. Uh, there are other conditions which might affect their renal functions, and there are other conditions which might affect their development. The difference between dwarfism and pygmies. Speaking to pygmies specifically is a deficiency of a particular hormone which is required for growth. There is uh, some particular hormone which is called insulin growth factor 2, which is important for functioning of the growth hormone. It is not considered a, a, a disability, even though individuals who are unfortunately abnormally short uh, do suffer a lot of other psychosocial problems. Uh, there are some uh, individuals who have got dwarfism is because of a metabolic disease affecting the bones, um, like achondroplasia or osteogenesis imperfecta, and because of that, they do suffer frequent fractures from very minor, minor trauma. And because of that, they will be disabled. I think the most important is, number one, is the awareness, because some of this can be prevented uh, with important screening. But some of these conditions, which are genetics, which cannot be uh, treated, then it's an important for awareness of people would understand why these individuals are abnormally short so that they can be, these individuals can be integrated into the community and accepted. Joachim Wangi is the founder and president of the non-profit organization Short Stature Society. It tells us more about some challenges faced by people with dwarfism and what can be done. He also shares his story. I was born with my pituitary glands dead, so they could not produce the growth hormones. When a child is born with pituitary dwarfism, they are given hormone boosters and they, uh, they regenerate growth hormones. But in Kenya, because it's in Africa, you know, we are not well developed until now. They don't have those type of medication or machines to detect a child has this type of condition. Sometimes my bones are very weak, so I cannot lift something which is very, very heavy. Ladies is where there's a lot of issues. They are so small, so like when they get pregnant most of them they cannot carry pregnancy for nine months sometimes doctors who don't know they take them through uh the normal labor and they have to go through a cesarean section you know so like we've lost a few members in kenya giving birth there's a lot of challenges first of all uh, getting into those public vehicles you know they are so high somebody has to lift you for us men we have a problem accessing public uh, toilets. My first day in high school was the worst day in my life I cannot even forget. Nobody wanted to sit close to me. And then when it came to break time, the whole school, they all came to our class to, to stare at me. After that, you know, when the teacher told them about me, that's when now they started to embrace me. Late last month, South Africa alerted the rest of the world to Omicron, raising fears that the highly mutated variant could spark a new wave of global infections for COVID-19. Experts say Omicron is more contagious but seems less virulent, presenting mild symptoms in many patients so far. Professor Salim Abdul Karim is director of the Center for AIDS Program of Research in South Africa, CAPRISA, and professor of global health, Melman School of Public Health at Columbia University. It tells us more about the current situation of coronavirus pandemic in South Africa. When we look at the uh, evolution of viruses, they will generally mutate 
and they would evolve into becoming more well adapted and they will then generate advantages. And what we've seen with SARS-CoV-2 is that transmissibility is the most important advantage. When you're getting viruses that are evolving to become more infectious, they will generally become less severe. So it was a very high level of uncertainty. And because of the uncertainty, people panicked. But we now have more information that shows that there are particular trends emerging. And at this early stage, that there's no reason for panic. There's no reason to create travel bans. It's COVID-19. We've dealt with the past variants. We're dealing with this variant. And we're going to deal with the other variants that are still to come. We saw an increase in the number of admissions in younger people, especially in the below fives. But that was a very early observation. But it looks like that that increase in the larger number initially of children below five has now changed. Even though we had more children initially, those were largely very mild cases. The number of reinfections in our fourth wave is increasing quite dramatically. There's a 2.4-fold increase in the number of reinfections. It looks like past infection is not providing protection against Omicron variant infection. This is not unusual because we saw the same with the beta variant. So right now, we are seeing cases of breakthrough infection and people who are fully vaccinated, but that's to be expected. No vaccine is 100% effective. We have some circumstantial evidence that suggests that immunocompromised individuals who develop a long-term persistent infection are able to lead to these kinds of mutations. And we've certainly seen that in cancer patients, patients with advanced HIV, and so on. So that's what we think is responsible for creating these variants. It's not strictly true to say that it's just vaccine inequity that's responsible, because in many of these individuals, two doses of vaccine, you still don't get a good immune response. But what there is with vaccine inequity and the low vaccine coverage is that there's a higher risk of immunocompromised individuals getting infected because of higher transmission of the virus. So vaccine inequity is indirectly associated with the creation of variants. Early in the pandemic, herd immunity was often referred to as the long-term goal in the fight against COVID-19. Epidemiologists refer to herd immunity as the tipping point when enough people are protected from the virus that the community can return to routine life. But variants of the virus and low vaccination rates have prolonged that goal. Early in the pandemic, herd immunity was often referred to as the long-term goal in the fight against COVID-19, the disease caused by the coronavirus. Herd immunity is when a significant portion of a community is immune to an infectious disease, making it harder for the disease to spread. Herd immunity offers the entire community protection and can be achieved either through recovery from a previous infection or through vaccination. Once people gain protection from an infectious disease such as COVID-19, it makes it more difficult for the disease to spread within the community, even to those unable to get vaccinated due to serious allergic reactions to the vaccines. Public health officials say it is unknown how long herd immunity may last. The percentage of people who need to be vaccinated to achieve herd immunity depends on the disease. For instance, about 95% of a population needs to be vaccinated to reach herd immunity for measles. For polio, it's about 80%. It is currently unknown how many people need to be vaccinated for COVID-19 to gain herd immunity, which is complicated by individual vaccine hesitancy and uneven rollout and access to the vaccines. Still, health officials say vaccination remains key in preventing people from becoming seriously ill or dying from COVID-19. Also wearing masks and practicing social distancing. For the latest news and coverage on the coronavirus, stay connected to Voice of America at voanews.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Linoch Mudu. That's our show for today. Until next time, stay well and strive to make every day a healthy day.